50% of you that are beekeepers are gonna lose your hives this winter. And I know those of you that are watching first time beginner beekeepers are probably saying to yourself, not me, I'm gonna be on the good side of the 50%. But are you? In today's video, I wanna talk about things you need to be looking at and for in your hives to get them ready for winter. We're gonna drill down specifically about bees of winter physiology that live up to eight months versus summer bees that only live about 40 days. Hi everybody, David Burns gonna be with you today. Thanks for joining me. I get a lot of questions from beekeepers around the country about how do I get my bees ready for winter? Now you think you would not wanna think about that in July. We're talking about heat, excessive heat all throughout the country. So it's kind of hard to think about cold winter when it's hot and you need to get your honey supers off, you need to treat for mites, I'll deal with winter later. It really doesn't work that way, to be honest with you. What ha what's happening in your hive now is gonna greatly affect your bee's ability to survive winter, even if you live in the south and have a short, mild winter, or if you live up north where you have a long, harsh winter. It's the same thing, it's just the duration is a little different. So today, don't dismiss that we don't need to think about winter in July, because we do. Everything you're gonna do in the month of July, August, September, and October plays a huge part in your bees being able to be ready to survive a harsh winter. Now, first let's talk about honeybees. Honeybees don't hibernate. They don't go to sleep in a nice little warm bed with blankets on them and wake up in the spring and yawn and stretch. Oh, look, that was a good rest. I see there's some flowers. What a winter, let's, let's open the doors and fly out and get nectar. They don't, they stay active all winter. Now they do cluster to stay warm, just like we would if we were freezing to death, we'd all get close together to try to stay warm. That's what bees do. But really by nature, they're in there wanting to do everything they do in the summer, they just can't because it's too cold to go fly outside. So they still wanna raise some brood, they still wanna take care of brood, they still wanna consume honey, they still wanna stay warm, but they really can't because it's too cold to do it. They're still active. Now, if the temperature gets above about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the bees become more active. That means that under 40 degrees Fahrenheit, they're pretty inactive. So they consume less food and they're not so apt to raise uh, a lot of brood or anything. They're just kind of in there idling by. But who has any kind of a winter like that, where the perfect temperature stays 40 degrees all winter long? Now, if it gets really cold and much colder, like zero or below zero, bees have to cluster very tight together and they have to actually consume more of their onboard resources to generate their muscle to make heat. Kind of like we rub our hands together to make heat, our hand, hands become warm. And muscles, when they are flexed, become warm. And that's what the bees do. They flex their wing and leg muscles to stay warm in the wintertime. Well, to power those muscles, they need fuel. They need protein and carbohydrate. And they start eating the fuel that they have on board in the form of pollen and nectar and honey. So they're eating their food and digesting it, using it to make body heat. So the colder that it gets during the wintertime, the more the bees are generating heat by consuming stored resources. On the flip side of that, as it gets above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, starts pushing 50 degrees and higher, bees start moving around a lot in the hive, even starting to take some cleansing flights outside the hive and flying. All of that uses a lot of energy, a lot of resources. So they begin consuming a lot of the stored resources. It is amazing how much bees can consume when it warms up a little bit in the winter and when it gets pretty cold in the winter, they start eating a lot of food. And, but the big thing about bees in the winter time is this, the Varroa destructor. Now, this little mite doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. You can throw some OA in there. You can use some Formic Pro, Apivar, Apigard, Hop guard three. I mean, you can just throw all these different treatments at this Varroa destructor, which is about the size in proportion on a bee as it is on me right now. If that gives you, a, <laughs> if that gives you a little bit of an idea of what you would feel like if you were a honeybee and you had a mite 
on your neck. It's hard to carry on business as usual. Hey guys, I'm gonna go forage now and get some nectar. I'll be back in a little bit. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's pretty distracting, isn't it? I mean, how would you even fly? You got one eye that's blinded. So Varroa destructor mite does play a huge role in bees surviving the winter. How that works is if your mites are left unchecked and you assume you don't have any mites and you do, what happens is the mites continue to use these little two things here to pierce into your honeybees and extract out, suck out the Hemolymph are the fat bodies from the bees. They're getting protein. So they are damaging, injuring your bees. And bees don't have a way to really heal like we do. So there's a lot of open wounds. But what's worse about it is these two little babies here that pierce into bees are dirty needles. Yeah, they're not using alcohol swabs to before they pierce. They're not wiping the needles off. So the Vera Destructor does transmit a lot of different viruses as they continue to go from bee to bee to bee. And, and that virus that gets into the bees actually is transferred as they feed each other. And so by controlling your viral destructor mite and getting this down to almost nothing, now is the time that you need to be doing it so that these bees in the next few months don't have this tremendous virus load going into winter. I'm helping you guys make fewer mistakes and keep healthier bees. And the most important way is to consider, how do I get this under control? I've got a lot of videos. In fact, I'll leave some videos in the description below of me teaching you how to bring this under control. We have a lot of methods, IPM methods, mechanical methods. We have some uh, genetic methods. You can use queens that are a little more hygienic uh, where they can control mites a little bit better. But treatment is probably gonna be your best option to keep mites under control. Now let's talk about bees of winter physiology, dearth physiology. These are bees that live a long time. Now, where this comes into play for all of us who are beekeepers is we have to have a lot of bees that can keep each other warm all winter long. Now, some people try to complicate how to get your bees through the winter. And you can talk about wraps, you can talk about heat lamps, wind breaks, you can talk about all of these things that helps your bees get through the winter, but that really isn't all that important. It really doesn't matter that much about those external things around your hive, for example, like a wrap or something. Let's don't go there just yet. I don't think that's very important to consider. I think what's important to consider is the overall health of your bees. I'm serious. Healthy bees survive winter. They always have. You might look at it like it is the very unhealthy bees that die in the wintertime. And those unhealthy bees are unhealthy because of usually the Vora destructor, some other pests or disease, or maybe they're unhealthy because they're low in population. And without having a robust population in the hive, it's difficult for a single colony to stay healthy when they get very small. So consider how are you gonna make your bees healthier in July, August, and September. That's critical right now. So we start by thinking, okay, gotta reduce the viral destructor mite. That's key number one. But I know for a fact that bees are starting to back down on going out on nectar flights. There's just not that much out here in Illinois anymore. You look around and you start seeing, okay, there's a little bit of clover, there's a little bit of soybeans, and. Okay, there's gonna be asters coming up in a little while. Yay, we're gonna have goldenrod, for example. Yay, that'd be great, my bees would be, I may even get a honey harvest off my goldenrod. No, I, I wouldn't count on it. And I've watched uh, bees bring in goldenrod pollen back into the hive. I've watched them uh, bring back in pollen from other sources in the fall, such as ragweed. And even though you see a lot of bees bringing pollen in uh, during, during late summer and fall, they're not storing it. There's not an abundance of stored pollen oftentimes in the fall. They're using it to consume it and to feed it and to raise their brood. All right, so here's how it breaks down. Pay close attention. I don't want you to miss out on this. Watch this video all the way through because I'm giving important tips as we navigate through this concept of how do you get your bees through the winter? This is priceless. You got to do it in July, August, and September and October. So let's start working on it. So again, you're gonna be like, yeah, watch this later. That's a problem 
people procrastinate getting their bees ready for winter until, until late fall. And at that time, it's too late. What, they, what most beekeepers do, uh, you know, after they harvest their honey, then they start thinking about how do I get rid of the mites? Uh, how do I wrap my hive up for winter so the wind doesn't blow on them and make them cold? They start thinking about it during the fall. By then, it's too late. Usually by then, the colony has become weakened and the colony's immune system has been compromised by the Vora Destructor that even if you burn off the mites in the fall with your special treatment that you like to use before winter, it really doesn't matter because even though these guys are gone, the damage has been done. They have infected the colony with viruses. Do you get that? The viruses live on in their host, the honeybee, even though you get rid of the mites. So the key is getting rid of the mites before they can bring this enormous amount of viral load into your hive. So you wanna start doing that in July, August, September. Now, I've made a video recently on how you can use a tiny little box to help control the viral destructor in the months of July, August, September. I'll leave a link in the description below about that tiny little box. That's gonna help you a lot. So let's talk about bees of winter physiology. Now, pay close attention, get out your notebook, guys. It's gonna be very beneficial for you. And a lot of you ask me this question, that's why I'm making this video so that you don't have to wonder and try to get a hold of me and ask me what I'm talking about, okay? Here it is, bees of winter physiology, bees of dearth physiology. As I continue to tell you more about bees of winter physiology, please subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up, it means so much. Let's continue. Here's what happens. When honeybees go through a period of time when there is no longer a strong nectar flow for two or three weeks, the bees begin to sense that and they begin to say to themselves or instinctively decide, uh-oh, look, we have to store up and kind of change how we're doing business. We're only living 40 days right now because we're working so hard bringing nectar in. We don't need a lot of uh, vitelogenesis in our system to do this. And so we just, we're not banking on a lot of protein in foragers, for example, phytelogen. So we're just kind of backing off and we're just running along knowing that as foragers get old and die after 40 days, hey, it's, it's spring or hey, it's summer. We'll just keep raising a lot of brood. We'll just 2,000 uh, new workforce being laid every day. So bees don't really have to worry much about what happens after 40 days? They just keep producing brood, brood, brood to get more nectar, nectar, nectar. But when there's a break in the nectar supply, that triggers the bees to realize, uh-oh, we can't keep doing this. If we're dying every 40 days, then without a nectar flow, we're in trouble. So the physiology of each bee begins to change. And so they're able to transition from worker bees that die after 40 days, they're actually able to raise honeybees now that can live up to four, six, even eight months. Now they start doing this once they hit this transitional period of being alerted that there is a nectar dearth. So in my case, what I love to do is once I see that there's an end to the honey flow, let me look, um, it's not bad, it is slowing down. So I've got a little bit of time. But in Illinois, what happens is you see bees kind of going in and out, in and out, gathering nectar, and all at once, one day, it's over. You go out there, you just don't see anything going on much. How do you determine when the dearth hits your area? Here's the best way I always suggest determining it. Go out, stand in front of your hive, take a look, watch your foragers going in and out. Can you count the, numbers, uh, the number of foragers going in and out of your hive within 60 seconds? Can you keep an accurate count? And if you miss one, you're like, oh, what was, I was on number 50. Oh, now I see three, I, I, can't tr I can't track it. Okay, that's not a dearth. A dearth is when you're able to actually count every bee going in and out within 60 seconds. What this means is there's not that many and it's easy for you to count them. That's a time of dearth. Bees still gonna go in and out. They're still gonna go find water, a flower over here and there but it's not so much uh, that it's hard to count. So once you go out there and see a drastic slowdown in your foragers, 
then you're probably hit a dearth. What I love to do at that point, usually for me, it's around the first week in August here. It depends on the rains and the flowers and all. It can be a couple of weeks off, but usually around the first week of August, and then all at once, the switch goes off. The bees aren't flying out much anymore at all, a little bit. Now, just think about that. There's nothing for them to go out and get until the fall asters that sometimes aren't showing up until September, like a month. And then those aren't really that plentiful enough to put supers on and gather a bunch of nectar, which means they can't use that incoming nectar and pollen to raise brood anymore either. So the whole hive starts to slow down a lot. In fact, I noticed years ago that bees were not even able to care for young larvae in my hives because they weren't being well fed on natural resources in the fall. Isn't that startling? I would just look in my... Uh, larvae and I would look down in the cells and young larvae were dying from a lack of food from the nurse bees. The nurse bees could not produce royal jelly because they could not consume enough uh, incoming nectar and proteins to actually continue to nurse the young developing larvae and they would die. And guess what happens when larvae dies? The bees consume young larvae because they're protein deprived. Wow, that's crazy. So you're making your hive go into winter already limping. This happens, this happens, friends, in the months of August, September, and October. When there's an absence of strong nectar flow, bees still try to maybe raise brood, but they can't supply the royal jelly for the first one to three days of larvae. So the larvae begins to dry up and die, then they consume it. It's really sad. That means that the bees that you're seeing doing all this work in your hive, they only live 40 days and you think your hive is well populated, but in reality, what you're looking at are bees that will die within the next 45 days. So you may go out there, let's say you go out there in the month of uh, August, September, and you're like, wow, this hive is so full of bees. I'm gonna have a great winter. Every bee that you see, most of them gonna be dead by Christmas. Yeah, even just as winter starts, all of those bees are going to age out. And it's only going to be the bees of winter physiology that live on. The strategy that we need to employ is that we need to be very aggressive in actually causing our hives to be stimulated to raise more bees of winter slash dearth physiology. The physio physiological change that happens to the bees that they raise in the months of August, September, October even November, are gonna live four to eight months. That's what we need to do. Wake up. <laughs> if you're fell asleep at the wheel, you don't understand what I'm saying here, let me say it again. You gotta raise bees of winter physiology. You need those bees for heater bees to keep the colony warm, especially if you live in a very cold climate, but most of the US has winter. But you need to focus on having uh, the hive virus-free, mite-free, before you start raising those bees of winter physiology. Hey, let's face it, let's say you do a good job raising bees of winter physiology, but you didn't control your mites and there's a lot of viruses. Uh-oh, now honeybees that are of winter physiology, they live four to eight months. Now the viral destructor viruses will cut their life in half. Instead of four to eight, they're gonna live two to four months. They're not even gonna help you get to spring if they're infected with viruses. So get your virus load. I'm just telling you all this. I'm just, I'm spoon feeding you. This is so cool. So get your virus loads down before you start raising bees of winter physiology so that you can get those four to eight months out of your bees that you need. So what you need to do now, look, you can ask other people and you can talk to them and they'll tell you, uh, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to do that because I don't think you should be, uh, you know, uh, raising bees. You get too many bees in the winter, so on and forth. Well, I, I, I followed that uh, historical pattern in years ago. I've been keeping bees since the 90s. And here in Illinois, I had the same problem with following historical methods, traditional methods. My bees weren't doing well surviving winter. And so once I made this change, I developed this technique of really uh, adding up and prompting my bees to raise a lot of bees in winter physiology. So look, here's the simple truth. Feed your bees heavily one-to-one -one sugar water with protein and amino bee booster and honey bee healthy in late summer, in fall, about two to three weeks 
after the nectar flow starts. So you want to pause so they can be triggered to start raising beads of winter physiology. But here's the thing. If they're triggered to raise beads of winter physiology due to a dearth, but they don't have any food to feed it, that's what I saw in my cells. They were trying to do it, but the larvae was drying up and dying from a lack of food. So what we're doing, we're feeding our bees in late summer and fall in order to, to really prop up the nurse bees so they can have plump glands to produce the royal jelly to feed the one to three day old larvae. See how important that is? So what we're trying to do is beef the hive up to assist them with nutrition to raise bees of winter physiology. Wow, I'm pumped and excited. <laughs> wow, I just gave you like the silver bullet of winter survival in a nutshell. Isn't it amazing? Okay, well, let's go on though. Here's some other things you need to be aware of. So let's say that the nectar flow stops, ends, and you wait two or three weeks, let them get in their uh, let them be motivated to realize that, uh oh, we need to do something. At that point, when they start raising bees of winter physiology, you're just simply assisting them with nutrition to carry it out. And once they carry that out, you should start seeing frame after frame after frame of solid capped over brood in the months of September and October. September, October, let's say they're raising 7,000 new bees on each frame. If you can have at least four to five frames you see in September and October, look at that. You're talking about 35 to 45,000 bees of winter physiology. That's about what you need, about 40,000 bees of winter physiology to keep that colony going all winter long. But I got another trick. I didn't, I didn't stop there. In all of my efforts over the last couple of decades and playing with bees, I didn't stop there. I realized that if I kept feeding my bees all winter, they stayed very healthy. Virus loads were down. But bees of better nutrition have a better chance at not being affected by viruses, not being affected so much by viruses. So it builds their immunity up by feeding them nutrition. And so I designed the Winter Bee Kind, which we start selling here in just a few weeks. I'll leave a link in the description below to get ready on August the 1st. But I keep feeding bees all winter long. I keep raising brood all winter long. Now, if you follow me for a while, you've seen my videos. I've got tons of videos. Please go back and look at the videos I film in the winter of what my bees look like in wintertime. They're, I have the most population of bees during the winter. Why? Because bees of winter physiology don't die every 40 days. I feed them in the winter, my winter be kind. They keep raising brood. They keep raising brood that doesn't die. Now, let me tell you a secret, a cool thing about winter bees, okay? Winter bees go in a state of readiness. And that means that they are ready for when the nectar starts to begin raising and caring for brood. They're not getting old and can't do anything anymore. They're staying very young and ready when the nectar starts flowing in to start raising brood. So bees of winter physiology kind of just pause right where they're at physiologically, and they wait until they can start using all of their glands, all of their resources to raise brood. That, even if they have to wait four to eight months, they're on standby. Isn't that astounding? Why haven't you ever heard this? <laughs> I mean, this is awesome. Golly, why not study bees? Why not figure out what bees do and then apply that to what you need to do to help them accomplish what they're trying to do anyway? It's awesome. You know, bees aren't really, uh, we try to domesticate bees. We bring bees that would rather just be active all year in a summer climate. We bring them into uh, a climate where they have to have these long periods of winter, which bees really don't prefer to do. They don't do well in that environment. So you have to watch how they're wanting to survive winter. And then you come alongside of them since we domesticated them and say, okay, I, there's some things I can do. Feeding them is a primary thing. Getting rid of the viruses before you start raising bees of winter physiology and then feeding them in late fall, feeding them all winter long is just awesome. And so many of you 
you leave a comment below as you've seen this in your own hives if you follow me. I've been doing this for a decade or longer uh, and I've had just outstanding luck. Now, it doesn't mean that you still may not lose your hive because if you fail to get rid of the mites, even though you feed them, you can't feed somebody to good health if they have a virus that's gonna kill them. So you've got to, you've got, it's gotta be like a one-two punch. Let's reduce the virus load. Now let's feed those bees and let's raise bees of winter physiology who are just primed and ready to make it through winter and let's feed them all winter long so they can raise brood all winter long. In fact, a lot of my colonies are so huge, they rarely even cluster during the winter time at temperatures of single digits or lower because there's so many bees in the hive. That's amazing. Now I've made another video just for you guys to show you how you begin feeding your bees once you give them a pause in the winter physiology. Here's a video right here about feeding in the fall and it'll help you so much. I'll see you over there.